NASA of creative music technology do? How do I lead the way in terms of showing the next generation how to work in this field? Something that I like to do is to try and expand what creative music technology might be, where you might do it, and who you might do it with. So with that in mind, I'm very keen on collaboration. I really like to work with other people. It gets me out of my dark little room with my computer screen and out into the real world. But more importantly, it gets me to meet different kinds of people, people who work in different areas, do different things, but they also think in different ways, and they talk in different ways. And I find that I can really learn a lot from that and bring it back to what I do. So something I particularly like to do is actually work beyond the arts completely and to work with scientists. I've done this quite a lot. There I find this uh, way of doing things, diff doing things differently, um, particularly interesting uh, and particularly different to the way that I'm used to thinking about things. I also, it fulfills a childhood ambition of mine in that I've always been interested in both. I've always been interested in art, and I've always been interested in science. And I found uh, that at school I was kind of forced one way or the other. I just about managed up to A-level to do science subjects and art subjects, but after that I had to choose one and I chose music. But I think it's a real shame these things are separated, and I don't think that they should be. Something that I found looking at the programme for today, not only is it a great lineup, some really good people talking today about really interesting subjects, but I was delighted to see that quite a number of them are crossing this boundary arts and science. So I feel kind of in good company here and that perhaps this is changing. So I'm here today to talk to you about dance room spectroscopy, which is a bit of a mouthful. I'm sorry about that. It's the name of a project and it's a, a collaborative project, an art science project. I'm collaborating with a lot of people on this. So I'm really t talking here today on behalf of a big team. I'm only one uh, of this uh, team. Probably the most important uh, member is this guy, uh, Dave Lewacki. Um, this project is his idea, it's his name, so you can blame him for the unpronounceable words. Um, David is a scientist, of course, and he works as a computational chemist at Stanford University and the University of Bristol. His day job is what this project is based on. And his day job consists of running computer simulations of molecular systems and what he's interested in is the way that matter and energy work together at a microscopic level. What he's particularly interested in is the dynamics of this system, how this system moves, how molecules move. I find this very interesting in getting to know Dave's work in that what I remember from school was static models of molecules, balls and sticks, they didn't move. We were kind of thought of them as static entities. And that seems to be something that's really changed in scientific thinking. Um, so here we have uh, what might appear to be a still image. Uh, this is an image of a diamond, uh, one of the hardest substances known to man, of course. Um, and you can see the lattice-like structure that makes up that um, crystal. But you might think of that as a static thing. Diamond, of course, you don't see it moving. Um, and it seems very hard and very dense. But this is actually a movie, and if I set it running, you'll see that even in this case, even in the hardest substance known to man, all the molecules are moving. And they're moving in a really interesting way. They're not just moving randomly, it's a complex but ordered system where every molecule influences the movement of every other molecule in the system. So we like to describe this as a dance, that the molecules are dancing together. It might seem a bit fanciful, Perhaps it is. But there's something to it. It's, it's something about the way these molecules influence each other is a bit the same as a choreography and the way in which dancers might move together and influence each other on a dance floor. Dancers might influence the way other dancers move. We're not the only people to use this language. Um, I've done a bit of Googling and I found many quotes. Uh, I could have had many different quotes on this slide of other scientists who use the word dance or related words to describe the movement of molecules, in this case as a wild dance floor. So, this brings me back to the title, a bit of a mouthful, sorry about that. The dance room bit, maybe we've covered now. We're imagining 
um, a molecular system as a dance room, as a room full of dancing molecules. What about the other bit, the spectroscopy bit? That's how you pronounce that word. Spectroscopy is the sci science of seeing things through light. And Dave has used this term here in a slightly tangential way to describe the fact that in dance room spectroscopy, you can actually see the molecules with light, with your eyes. Of course, in the real world, this is impossible. At the microscopic level, light itself is particles. So the idea of being able to see other particles with them uh, is uh, nonsensical. But in our system, you can see them. So this brings me to what dance room spectroscopy is. It's a simulation where you can see molecules and you can dance with them, you can move with them. And this is what makes this a remarkable project for me, is that it really furthers understanding, it's furthered my understanding of the way in which our microscopic world works. Usually, this is described using numbers, using equations, using formulas, using algorithms. And for a lot of us, myself included, that's a barrier to entry. We don't speak that language. We don't understand those equations. And so we don't understand what actually is a quite simple thing about how energy and matter work together. If we can feel it, if we can see it, if we can hear it, then perhaps we can. So this is what dance room spectroscopy is and how it works. It's an installation, it's an immersive environment, usually about kind of this size, the size of this stage, but we work in all sorts of configurations. Uh, the video projection is designed to be immersive, so it's never a single screen. It will always surround the people who are interacting with it. And in the projection, on the projection, you will see the molecular system working in real time, a, a scientifically accurate simulation of molecules working together. But crucially, you'll see yourselves. You will have yourself an energy <coughs> avatar. This is made possible by recent um, innovations in human-computer interaction, and in particular, depth sensors, which can see human beings, in particular, in three dimensions, and track the movement of every part of the human body. What we use for this, certainly in the first version, are Kinect sensors, the Microsoft Kinect which was designed to work with the Xbox games controller, but we hacked it to work with the supercomputer and top-end graphics cards to produce this molecular simulation. The way in which you, put, you are put into the simulation is very interesting, and, and probably the bit that's most difficult for me to talk about as a non-scientist. Um, but Dave has a very good metaphor for this, um, which is a way of representing the energy landscape, so the way in which energy would be distributed through a space. And that's what you can see in the left-hand image there, is a graph of an energy landscape. Areas that are red are hot. Um, so those are the areas with the highest temperature in this simulation. And in this graph, they're also represented as being high. Areas with low energy are blue and low. And to visualize the way in which molecules might move through that landscape, you can take it in a very literal way. Imagine, and this is terrible science, I'm sure, you had a handful of molecules, they're like ball bearings, and you dropped them onto that landscape. They would naturally roll downhill. They would roll away from the areas of high energy and towards the areas of low energy. So in dance spectroscopy, you become a feature in this energy landscape. You see an image there on the right-hand side. And I don't know about you, but I can see that in a kind of optical illusion type way. I can see it kind of protruding from the screen or being an indentation into the screen. And in dance room spectroscopy, both are possible. So you can either be a high energy energy field, in which case you're like a hill in the landscape. Molecules will naturally flow away from you. And it's as though you're kind of swimming through them. Or you can be a cool feature in the energy landscape, in which case molecules will be drawn towards you and into you. Anyway, hopefully that's given you some idea as to how it works. What I want to do now is show you a few images in a short um, video of the system. So these are all um, in a dome configuration. This is how we've most often done downstream spectroscopy in quite a large um, immersive projection dome with projections all the way around the audience. So you really do feel like you're part of this. And these are all photographs um, from all around the world, actually. 
of uh, the downstream spectroscopy dome. <coughs> this one I put in, it's the only one of the system from the outside, the dome from the outside, just to show how far we've taken this geographically. Uh, this is in Bhutan, right at the top of the Himalayas. That's the, the, the furthest we went with our little um, downstream spectroscopy dome there. Anyway, now I have a short movie, um, so you can actually see the, the movement of the molecules and also hear the sound, which is also generated by the system and is part of the energy landscape. In the last part of my talk, I want to talk about a few offshoots from the downstream spectroscopy project. It's been a gift that keeps giving, uh, and many other things have grown out of it over the last few years. Um, the first is a piece called Hidden Fields, which is a full-length dance performance, an evening dance performance that might take place in a theatre such as this. Um, not surprisingly, we had a lot of interest from dancers uh, in downstream spectroscopy, uh, and I ran a series of workshops at the Arnold Feeney. Um, to explore what could be done with it as a dance piece. Um, and that led to this performance, which I'm not going to say a great deal about. I've got a few more uh, images, which you've already seen, um, and a movie. This image is from the cover of Leonardo, which is the MIT Press's publication on the arts and sciences. So we're very pleased with that. And yeah, here's a short trailer. Another project, Molecular Music, this has been my baby really, I've led on this one, where instead of putting dancers into the simulation, we put musicians into the simulation. And instead of driving it using these energy avatars, we've actually used the sound of the music to drive the simulation. I find this very interesting, of course, mu music, sound is movement as well, it's vibration, and molecules vibrate as well, so we can do some really interesting things to kind of link those together. And we've worked with some great musicians like Nicola Bernadetti, very famous violinist there with her trio, uh, and Charles Hazelwood, who's a classical um, conductor, in this case working with the Charles Hazelwood All-Stars, which are uh, an amazing improvising ensemble. The current state of this research um, is in a, pro a system called NanoSimbox, 
And this is pushing the educational angle of the system. It's always been an educational tool, I think, in terms of understanding molecules, but this is specifically aimed at schools. And it's a mini version of downstream spectroscopy geared towards the desktop, and you control it with your hands rather than um, with your whole body. smaller and you can change the temperature some of them are like matchsticks and then other ones are like fat like an inflated granny <laughs> I'm just being creative. It's all about atoms and molecules and all that jazz. You can have fun with it. So like when you make things bigger and smaller, you could even like play catch with atoms. And where we're taking this next is into virtual reality. Um, these photos are very hot off the press. These are just from a couple of weeks ago, where we were at the Barbican um, in London. They've always been very supportive of this project. Um, and they gave us a residency for a week um, to start to put together a virtual reality version of downstream spectroscopy. Already there, we've got two users in a single virtual reality space working, moving molecules and interacting with them and we hope to expand this up to eight users. Thank you very much. Great to be here today. And thank you.